Hello and welcome back to Manifolds, the video series about generalized surfaces and the calculus we can do on them. And in today's part 32, we continue talking about orientable manifolds. Indeed, we will give some alternative definitions for the concept of an orientation. This is important to know because different people will use different definitions. In the end, everything is equivalent and that's what we will talk about today. However, before we start, as always, I really want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And please don't forget that you can download the additional material with the link in the description. Okay, and then I would say, let's start a discussion by considering an orientable manifold. Roughly speaking, it means that at each point on the manifold we have an orientated tangent space. So the vector space given by the tangent vectors is orientated. Moreover, the orientation should stay the same if we go through all the points in the manifold. Hence, you could say all the corresponding bases are positively orientated. In particular, we want that a full collection of coordinate bases is positively orientated. And indeed, it's not so easy to understand, therefore it's good that in this video we discuss equivalent notions. And let's state this as a fact, which you should definitely remember. And now the assumption we need here is that M is an n-dimensional smooth manifold. So indeed the same as always, but now we are able to write down three equivalent claims. And the first one, of course, should be that M is orientable. And this means we use the definition from the last video. Hence, we can choose such a family of orientated tangent spaces, which means for every point P on the manifold, we have such a pair. And moreover, this family should satisfy that we find a collection of charts such that every coordinate basis like that is positively orientated. Or to say it more precisely, it's an element of the chosen orientation. Okay, and this is exactly what we mean when we say we have an orientable manifold. And now in part b, we will see that there is a simpler description of that. Simpler means that we can completely describe it on the lower level. And for that, we just have to choose a suitable atlas for the manifold M. And as a reminder here, an atlas is just a collection of charts that cover the whole manifold M. Of course, we already know that we have our maximal atlas for the smooth manifold, but the statement here is that we don't need this maximal one, we just need any one that fulfills the following. Namely, we want that all the transition maps, which are clearly differentiable, should conserve our orientation. Hence, we are only interested in the differential of this omega, which means in the Jacobian. And the Jacobian matrix we usually denote by J omega. And then we also go through all possible points x. And at this point, you already know, changing the orientation is measured with the sign of the determinant. And since we don't want to change the orientation, the determinant should be greater than zero. Okay, so this is the whole claim and I said it's a simpler description because we only deal here on the lower level, we only deal in Rn. And this might be easier to understand because we don't have to go to the abstract tangent space. Okay, and now before we prove this equivalence, let's state the last equivalent claim here. This one is also really nice to know because it brings in differential forms. Indeed, being orientable guarantees the existence of a very special differential form. Namely, we have a so-called volume form, which means an n-form on the n-dimensional manifold. We also use the letter omega here, but obviously it's a different omega than before. In fact, it's always possible to get such an omega here, but we want a useful one. And useful means that later we can actually use it to measure volumes, which means it should be non-zero. More precisely, we need that the alternating n-form that comes out for any point p is non-zero. And so that's the whole claim. 
having such a volume form is equivalent for m being orientable. However, we don't have the tools yet to formulate a proof of this equivalence and therefore in this video we only prove the equivalence of a and b. But don't be distressed, we can do the proof in a later video. For now it's just important that you know these equivalences and indeed the first one is not so complicated. The whole proof can be explained by reusing the picture from before. For any two charts h and k that overlap, we have a requirement for the orientation. This means the first thing we can do here is to translate this picture to the tangent spaces. And let's just fix one point p in this intersection here. This implies that we only have to consider one tangent space. So this here is our tangent space TPM. And moreover, on the lower level, we already had vector spaces, so the tangent spaces are the same, we just have Rn there. But what changes are the maps, because now we have the differentials of all the maps involved. This means here we have dhp and here dkp. And most importantly, we have the differential of the transition map here, which can be represented by the Jacobian. So let's write j omega at the point p. You know, usually we would write p tilde, where p tilde is the image of p under the chart h. However, in order to keep the notation clear and simple, let's omit the tilde in the following. Okay, and now it's important to know what the differentials dh and dk actually mean. And it's helpful to consider parameterizations again. So let's say here on the left hand side, the inverses are given by phi and psi. Then the common notations we had on the right hand side here were given by phi star and psi star. Of course, these are also differentials, but these were the names we have chosen before we introduced the differential. It's still helpful to consider these names because they define the so-called coordinate basis in TPM. In other words, now we can have two different coordinate bases in TPM. And you already know, what we want in the end is that the orientation of both bases is the same. Okay, and now this picture here tells us that we have a nice equation, namely phi star is equal to first j and then psi star. In other words, composition phi star with the Jacobian is equal to phi star. And in order to work with the coordinate basis, we have to put the canonical unit vectors into both maps. So let's say we first put in E1, the first canonical unit vector in Rn. And then you see on the left hand side, what we actually get here is the first column of the Jacobian. This is exactly how the matrix vector multiplication works. And maybe to keep it clear here, let's introduce some names for the coefficients in this column. Let's say we call them lambda 1, lambda 2 and so on. And of course we have exactly n numbers in this column. And obviously if you find it helpful, you can write it as a linear combination of canonical unit vectors again. Okay, and then this implies that our equation from before just states something about a linear combination in TPM. Indeed, please don't forget, after the star maps here, we work in the tangent space. So what we have here is that a linear combination of tangent vectors is equal to one tangent vector on the right. Moreover, we know by definition that these tangent vectors here come from the coordinate bases. Namely, the one on the right is the first basis vector with respect to the chart H. And then on the left, we have the basis vectors with respect to the chart K. In fact, here we have to write del J. And now we see this is a beautiful result because it gives us a representation of this basis vector with respect to another basis. Or to say it more concretely, now we know how the change of basis in TPM works. And if you know some linear algebra, you also know that this is usually described by the change of basis matrix. This means if you have one basis B and another basis C, switching between these bases 
is given by a matrix. And in our case here, the two bases B and C are just defined by our two charts H and K. And usually the change of basis matrix gets a name like T and I use the same notation as in my linear algebra course. So I write the basis B comes in and the new basis C comes out. And in fact, by the equation here, we already know one column of our T. Namely, we already know the coefficients we need to represent the old basis vector with the new basis vectors. So if we call this equation star, then this implies that we have lambda 1, lambda 2 and so on in the first column of our change of basis matrix. However, of course, the first column was only demonstrative because we can do the same thing for all the other columns. The only change we have to do for that is to replace E1 here with E2, E3 and so on. Hence, in conclusion, what we get here is that this change of basis matrix is equal to our Jacobian. All columns coincide, so the matrices are the same. And this is a very nice result because it connects our concrete lower level here with our abstract upper level. And in particular, we can conclude that the sign of the determinants of the matrices are the same. And important for us is that the one determinant is greater than zero if and only if the other determinant is also positive. And actually, this is the equivalence A to B from before. The right hand side is obviously B because of the Jacobian, but you should also see that A is described by these change of basis matrices. Indeed, if you recall the last video, this is exactly how we have defined the equivalence classes given by orientations. While changing to another basis, we don't change the orientation if and only if this determinant is positive. So you could say this is a less abstract version of the statement described in A. Okay, and there we have it. We have proven that A is equivalent to B. Sadly, we are not able to do the proof with C, but in the next videos, we will do the groundwork such that we can do it in the future. So I really hope we meet there and have a nice day. Bye bye.